morning. All righty. Well, welcome to you all who joined us last month for uh, capacity building and welcome to all of our new viewers. Hello. Um, over the next hour, we will be focusing on reverse mentoring and we want this uh, webinar to be interactive. So we will be using the chat feature. I will pause our speaker throughout our time together for me to address any comments or questions that come into the chat. You can also submit your questions, comments to me directly um, by sending me a direct chat. Today's webinar will be facilitated by Shana Young, and Shana is the Executive Director of the Leadership Institute, as well as the Assistant Vice President for Leadership Development for Columbus State University. So please help me welcome Shana in the chat. And with that, I am turning it over to you, Shana. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. And thank you for being here and tuning in to learn a little bit about reverse mentoring and whether or not this session sounds like or this process sounds like something you may want to give a try within your organizations. Um, reverse mentoring is a fairly new concept um, and something that people are just now really, well, people and organizations are just now really grabbing a hold of and seeing how, understanding how this can be really effective within your organization. Um, and so today we're going to talk about typically what it is, um, what does it require, why is it a good idea, why you might want to consider doing it, and then towards the end of our time together, uh, I'm going to talk about how you could potentially set this program up within your organization um, and make it effective for you. So as Brianna said, we are going to be spending about 45 minutes together today, leaving time for questions. If you have any questions throughout, please feel free to just drop them in the chat and I can ask them as we go through. Um, or you can hold until the end and then we can have an open discussion about maybe some of the things you'd like to discuss in regards to reverse mentoring. I do have a document I'd like to share with you at the end, kind of um, giving you some information you can walk away with, um, download, keep for yourself in regards to reverse mentoring. So let's get started. Uh, first off, let's talk about what exactly is reverse mentoring. So a, a, a typical mentoring situation is when senior managers or senior people, sometimes these are retirees, sometimes these are other people within the organization who are engaging with junior managers or younger people in the organization or in their community by sharing their life and work experiences. So we here at the Leadership Institute have set up a couple of mentoring programs for some of the businesses and organizations we work with where senior managers are partnered with younger or newer employees to share those experiences and life lessons learned and things of that nature. We've also set it up where um, managers in that organization are paired up with maybe senior people within the community. So they may not even necessarily be within your organization. They may just be people within the community um, and they pair, pair up with junior, younger people within your organization um, so they can learn from these seasoned individuals in your community and not just their business. So reverse mentoring is exactly what it says. It's the opposite of that. So what we do in reverse mentoring is we create a unique relationship where senior level employees or managers are mentored by more junior employees. And these junior employees may be younger. Um, it may be that they are of a differing background, uh, differing perspectives. They may not even necessarily be younger. In some cases, they're just new to the organization. And these reverse mentors then share back with these senior mentees, their experiences within the organization, their own life experiences. Um, they talk about topics of relevance that may influence the strategic direction or the culture of the organization. So this is reverse mentoring is a really great opportunity for senior leaders 
within your organizations to get a quote unquote temperature check, right? Of how younger, more junior or newer employees within the organization um, are feeling about the work, are feeling about the business, are feeling about the culture. So it allows for them to be able to learn in that opposite direction. So why try reverse mentoring? What is the point? Why is it important? How can it be helpful to your organization? So 97% retention rate among participants. And this is um, something we learned when we went to ATD, which is the Association for Talent Development Conference, where they we attended several sessions a couple of years ago on this idea of reverse mentoring. And all of the organizations that spoke during these section, sessions talked about how um, the retention rate of participants was a huge reason why they were implementing and then deciding to keep doing these reverse mentoring programs. It really gave their new and younger employees the opportunity to feel heard, and it gave their more seasoned employees the opportunity to learn some new skills, to hear about some things within the organization they may never have heard about otherwise, um, and to really take the temperature of the organization um, of the culture there and make some changes in order to keep um, retention rates high as well. 67% of junior participants are often offered promotion opportunities after participating in a reverse mentoring program. Um, when they have the opportunity to mentor those above them, they're creating relationships and they're getting to know people. And so they become top of mind when um, hiring and promotion decisions are being made uh, within the organization because they've had the opportunity to interact with and meet and talk to some of these more senior um, officers or employees within the organization. Uh, Generation Z is going to be making up approximately 30% of our workforce by 2025. So if you haven't gotten to know your Gen Z employees yet, or you haven't really gotten their perspective on your business, this is a great way to do that. Um, getting these Gen Z employees integrated, involved, and in, um, and giving you feedback on the future of work and the future of business from their perspective and what changes may need to be made in your organization in order to stay relevant to what will soon be 30% of the workforce. Um, preparing to shift from knowledge workers to learning workers. So um, previous work generations have been set up in the sense that those of us who are older employees have all the knowledge, right? We know how everything works. Everybody comes to us. We have the institutional knowledge, the organizational knowledge. We have everything people need to know. That is shifting drastically, right? It's hard to know what you do and don't know about your business on a day-to-day -day basis almost anymore. Things are just changing so quickly and so rapidly. So we're shifting from being the people who have the knowledge to being the people who need to be learning something new every day and need to have an open mind that whereas at one point in my career, I may have known it all. At this point in my career, I do not know it all. I understand I don't know it all and I need to be open to learning from everybody around me that there are new ways, faster ways and better ways to do things. Um, and to speak to that, 44% of the skills required for work will have changed by 2025. So what used to work for us will no longer work in the next year or so. So much of what we will need to know about how to do our jobs, we don't know yet. It's changing so rapidly. Um, hybrid and remote work because of the pandemic has changed the way we work. AI is rapidly shifting the way we work the chat GPT options, the ways to create things. We can't be resistant and suspicious of it just because we don't understand it. We've got to learn how to use it and incorporate it into our businesses and make it work for us. And we may need other people to teach us how to do that. Skills that we have had basically have a five-year shelf life. So in about five years, what you know how to do well, something about it is going to change. 
Um, and so it may change entirely. It may become obsolete. The skills that you needed to get your job are not the same skills you now need to keep your job. And with Gen Z being 30% of the workforce and skills having shifted and changed, we have got to be, as older generations, open to learning something new. I mean, it's no slight against us. Things change. We were, we were great at it before. We may not be so great at it when it starts making changes. So we need to be ready and open and how to learn these things and be ready and prepared to to do that and, and how we can do that and stay on the forefront of that is really this reverse mentoring process. 50% of our workforce will be freelance and gig workers by 2030. Uh, I think we're seeing more and more of this. I know from a university perspective, most of our students, uh, well, I won't say most, I will say probably 50% of our students really hope to find jobs where they can be hybrid or remote work um, a lot of them are looking to be freelance and gig workers. They're not necessarily working um, or hoping or desiring to go in and work full time for a corporation or a business like most all of us have all of our lives. Um, so by 2030, 50%, just think of your business now and 50% of the people that you work with, if they're not already freelance contract, and that's what gig is and getting a gig, um, the gig process, the gig workers are all over the country, right? They're they're not here. You're not in an office building together. Um, they're only working on this one project for you, and then they may be gone. They're only working on this one project for the company, and they're out working somewhere else. Um, everybody wants to be, not everybody, 50% of our workforce wants to be self-employed. And so that's what we're going to be dealing with. So we need to be ready for that. And either we need to be thinking about how to do that ourselves or we need to be thinking about how to approach work, realizing that everybody we're working with may be interchangeable pretty regularly. If they're freelance and gig workers, they may be coming in and out of your work life on a regular basis. It won't just be your standard office crew that you've seen before. The idea of a regular nine to five work week really doesn't exist um, a lot anymore. Now, of course, there are some industries and some businesses where this is exactly the type of work you do and you have to do. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's actually going to stay that way either. Again, this goes right along with um, Gen Z being approximately 30% of the workforce, 44% of the skills we're going to need to work uh, will have changed and 50% of our workforce are freelance and gig workers. So this nine to five is really not, um, the younger generation isn't buying into it as much as, as we did for our generations. It doesn't make it right or wrong. It just makes it different. And so we need to figure out how to approach that. And another great way to try, a reason for trying reverse mentoring is do you know who's influencing your organization's leaders? Who are the people who are in your organization's ear, your organizational leader's ears? Who are telling them what is going on? Who is the one who is, you know, sharing how the business should grow and change uh, in, in order to stay around? If you sit in and think about who is making the decisions within your organization, it is most likely the same group of people, right? It's executive leadership team, maybe a board, if you have a board who has their ear. A lot of times, those people who sit on the board are friends of the executive leadership team. That's how they got on the board. They knew somebody. There are a lot of relationships there that influence what your organizational leaders choose to do and choose not to do. If you set up a reverse mentoring process specifically for your executive leadership team and your senior leaders, they may have the opportunity to hear what is happening, quote unquote, on the ground floor in your organization. They may have the opportunity to be influenced by some of the information that these younger and or newer leaders within um, your organization 
need to share. A lot of that information and what they know and what they experience, it never makes it to the people who are really making the decisions. If you set up a reverse mentoring program, you can ensure that some of that information is making it. Now, whether they do anything with it or not, we can't, we can't force their hands there, but we can ensure they're getting the information because they're participating in this reverse mentoring program. Some of the benefits of reverse mentoring, it will give your organization a fresh perspective. So again, thinking about who is influencing your senior leaders, who is in their ear, who is telling them, you know, how great things are and how wonderful things are or what needs to change. Um, it, are, the, are they hearing the right things from the right people who are actually experiencing the work on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, this process empowers your emerging leaders. It really helps them, since they're on the mentor side, be able to find their voice be able to feel comfortable and in a safe space to share information um, in a wide variety of things. It's a safe space for them to teach a senior leader how to do something new. Um, it's a, it's, it really sharpens that saw for them um, and it really keeps it sharp for the senior leaders who participate, right? So we're giving the emerging leaders the opportunity to grow their personal relationship skills, to be able to have the conversations they need to have within an organization. But at the same time, the senior leaders who participate as the mentees get to keep their sharp, their saw sharp because they are maybe hearing about things or learning about things that they didn't know before, maybe even being open to being taught how to do things new and differently in a safe space. Um, sharing skills, breaking down generational stereotypes. A lot of times they build mentoring, uh, reverse mentoring programs just to talk about this, just to talk about what stereotypes we have of each of the different generations and how we can break through and break those down and see each other as people. It increases retention, which we saw on the previous slide. It drives culture change. If you get a sense that there's a, um, the negative culture within your organization, the greatest way to really take that temperature and figure out what needs to change is through a reverse mentoring program. And it promotes belonging. It allows people who maybe feel marginalized or don't have a voice, feel they don't have a voice within your organization to have a voice. And now they feel like they have a place and possibly a person that they can share information with. So let's talk about what skills does mentoring require. Now, mentoring requires these skills, whether you're a senior leader being a mentor or whether you are a doing the reverse mentoring thing and being a junior leader mentoring a senior leader. So these are things we all need to have. They may seem like basic skills, like everybody should know this. But I'm telling you now, um, a lot of people don't, or they think they do, but they don't. So people who participate in mentoring, they need to be active listeners. When you're in that mentoring project process, they need to show genuine interest. Um, the mentor needs to be able to listen to the mentee and pick up on these aspects of what's being shared with them. You know, demonstrating that they are understanding they need to make eye contact, okay? If you're meeting via phone, they need to have limited interruptions. And so for the younger generation, you may need to deliberately state these things, right? Like if you're meeting via phone, then close your door or don't take other calls or don't be working on other things, right? Give your mentee your undivided attention during that time that you're together. You know, if the mentee reaches out via email, you should really respond to them within 48 hours. That's really showing that you are active and engaged in the process. Um, and the mentor should be asking a lot of questions of the mentee. You know, what are your challenges? What are your goals? What do you want to get out of this? Another important skill for mentors is to build trust. So keeping conversations and other communications with your mentee confidential. This is an essential part of this process um, and should absolutely be something that both participants 
physically sign a document regarding confidentiality confidentiality as a part of participating in this process. If we are going to create a safe space for um, mentees to uh, share maybe some business information with a younger or junior employee about some things they want to change, they have to make sure that that mentor is not going to share that information outside of the confidence of this meeting. And vice versa, if if the mentor shares with the mentee, you know, some of the things that they are really struggling with within the organization, some problems they see, some issues that may be going on, they need to know that that mentee is going to be open to hearing the information and that they're not going to be, you know, um, they're not going to be repercussions for having shared the truth with that individual in that moment, even when it's something they may not have wanted to hear. Another part of building trust is honoring schedules, right? Everybody's busy. Everybody um, has things to do. So when you participate in a mentoring process, the mentor and the mentee need to honor each other's time, whether it's virtual, in person, or on the phone. When you set up these meetings, you know, especially in reverse mentoring, this mentor is a senior executive leader. The mentee is a senior executive leader within the organization and they have agreed to participate in this program and agree to be there, listen, and be open to the process, the mentee needs to show up, okay? We can't have lots of people just not being around and not showing up for meetings and vice versa. These junior level employees have taken time out of their day to participate in this program as mentors. They can't have executive level leaders just calling out, not showing up or canceling meetings. What does that say, right? What does that say about the importance of this if, if they're not participating? Um, if any changes have to be made, you need to let your mentor know as soon as possible or mentee know being on time and, and being present by showing interest and support and honesty is really what builds trust. And the one thing you can't do in mentoring sessions is talk negatively about others within the organization. You can share things that need to change within the organization overall. What you can't do is just go in there and complain about a specific person that you don't like, right? It's not the time or the place for that. What you wanna talk about is maybe behavior changes that you have seen within the organization that need to change or some cultural things that are going on within the organization that maybe need to change. Um, you could talk about things like that, but it's not the time to bad mouth the person. Um, exact, assess exactly what you have to offer as a mentor. So those junior, um, employees or leaders who are thinking about participating as mentors in this process, what are their skills? What are their strengths? What are their experiences and their knowledge that they feel like they can impart as a part of this mentor process to the people who will be mentees? What are they bringing to the table? And really discovering similarities and differences between the mentor and the mentee within that relationship will also really help with trust building. Determining goals and building capacity. So remember, this is about growing the mentee. It's not the opportunity for the mentor to really focus on their own career growth or what they want to do next in their career. That's not what this is. They are the mentor in this process. They are trying to grow the mentee. So when the executive leader comes in as a mentee, it's not the time for the mentor to be like, I'd like my next steps in my career to be, and here's my resume, and maybe you can help me do this. That is not what this is. It is about that mentor, the junior employee, growing the senior employee in a skill or company knowledge, et cetera. They should be prepared to assist them in connecting with resources. So people, books, articles, tools, anything that could be helpful to the reason why they decided to, to be a part of this reverse mentoring process. Um, and then encouraging and inspiring. You want people to be complimentary. You wanna be complimentary of their accomplishments. You wanna communicate your belief in their capacity to grow and reach whatever the goal is they may have set for their men the mentor process. Respond to frustrations and challenges with words and support of understanding and encouragement and then share it's always good for, especially in this reverse mentoring process, for people to share their own personal leadership philosophy 
or maybe the philosophy of some leaders that has inspired them so that they can each see how they're approaching the leadership process um, from maybe different angles. Some things you must get right for reverse mentoring to be a successful program within your organization. First off is you need a strong sponsor, someone high up in the organization who is willing to participate and also be a verbal champion of the program. So you need someone that people trust and believe in, especially the first round through of a reverse mentoring program who is a senior executive leader, who is willing to participate in the program, and then who is willing to champion the program for you afterwards. Because those senior leaders who would be future mentees are going to be looking to them to see how they feel about the process before they themselves sign up. Same for the junior mentees. You need someone who has um, strong leadership skills, who is looked upon highly and favorably within the organization. Um, for that very same thing, to be the champion for the program itself. You really have to make sure that you've got the right match, okay? So have mentors and mentees complete an application process that lists their skills, their reasons for wanting to participate, their areas of expertise and interest in order to make the right match. And so anytime we do mentoring and or coaching here through our uh, organization here at the Leadership Institute, we always have the either coachy or mentees submit assessments or survey questions, not a lot, just a few, that let us know what they're hoping to get out of the process and out of the program. And for the mentoring side of this, you want to know what are their skills, why are they interested in participating so that you can match the right two people up? You don't want to match somebody who's interested in learning about how to use chat GPT and all these different ways to a person whose skills are not in that area, who's not going to be able to teach them how to do that as a part of this mentoring process. You can also partner with your internal partners as a part of this too. HR, learning and development team leads can really help you out here. Um, as far as helping to find those right matches, those right partners, and those people that you need to participate, especially in the first go round. You want to address any fear or distrust in regards to participating. So making sure that you address confidentiality and fear of retribution. So we touched on this on the previous slide, but it is a real thing that people are concerned about when they're participating in any mentoring program but especially in the reverse mentoring program, the mentees who are the senior leaders are concerned about confidentiality. Are these young junior mentors gonna keep confidence when I share some of the things that are going on or how I want them to help within this organization? I may disclose an issue we're having because I want their perspective on it, but they can't then go out and just share all of that to anybody and anywhere within the organization. And it's the same with the mentees on the side of, hey, you know, if I tell my the, the person I'm mentoring that the culture here at our organization is pretty negative and people are upset or disgruntled about things, I don't want to have any fear that later on there's going to be retribution against me for sharing that kind of information. That's where that confidentiality agreement comes in and real understanding as a part of signing that comes in. Yes, Bree. So this slide brings up a, a question for me. Since the emerging leader or younger employee will have this business insight directly from executive leadership, what are your thoughts on participating in reverse mentoring being tied to promotion or to performance rewards? What are your thoughts on that? I don't think it should be tied to anything specific. Um, I think it should be a voluntary program. Um, that, you know, you do because you have something to offer. I think, you know, if you put that in your annual evaluation that you participated, it should be a little, you know, noted bonus that you're participating in programs and things that your organization has to offer um, out of your own will to want to do it and out of your own desire to make things better, not because there was really any um, uh, intrinsic incentives 
or, or realistic actual incentives for you to participate. Um, so I think it's, it's better to keep it voluntary um, than it is to tie it to any kind of real reward for the mentees, right? Because this is, I mean, for the mentors in this particular reverse mentoring process, this is really a great opportunity for them to build a lot of skills and build some relationships. Um, and so you may want to have, and you'll see down there at the bottom, find ways to make it rewarding. You may want to find ways to make it rewarding. Networking, you know, reminding any of the mentors that participate that this is a networking opportunity. Um, this is a relationship building opportunity. Um, and the opportunity for them to learn something as well as part of these conversations. But that's about as far as I would probably go with it. Thank you. It's really up to, to each organization. You want to make sure that you're ensuring a, a strong commitment from both the mentors and the mentees, right? So everybody's busy. So when people are signing up for this, we want to make sure that they understand the time commitment and that they agree to it and that they respect it. Uh, and that you're making the most of the one hour that you're going to have as a part of this mentoring process over however many months. You want to make sure that they are committed and you want to make sure a couple of things, right? That the mentees who are the senior leaders are ready and able to receive some constructive criticism about the business and the organization from some junior and younger employees. That may mean that you need to do a little bit of training before the reverse mentoring process begins with these mentees who are senior leaders on how to receive criticism, right? Um, and they also need to be ready to take action on some of the suggestions that may be shared or discussed here um, on how to improve the business and the organization. And everybody needs to have realistic expectations. Obviously, not everything that's shared can be implemented and done, but you need to be open to the idea that some changes may need to be made and you'll take the suggestions back. And if you choose not to do them, be ready to say why. And the mentors who are the junior executives here um, doing the mentoring may need a little bit of training on how to share constructive criticism with some people. How can I say this in a way that I'll be received and heard and won't automatically put this senior leader on the defensive that I'm just here to poo-poo on a bunch of their ideas and things that they implemented 20 years ago? That's not the, that's not the, the point. The point is to try to help the organization grow, right? and grow in the right direction with the right thing. Again, being respectful of people's time um, is really important as a part of this process. I think the success or failure of mentoring programs really hinges on respecting people's time and making sure that that time they are together is used constructively and that they both feel like they're getting something out of this. We wanna foster open communication here and you can do this through surveys. And understand that if the match isn't a good match, if the mentor-mentee match isn't a good match or somebody isn't responding, <coughs> that's okay. Let's make a change. You know, just let whoever is running the reverse mentoring program know that, hey, you know, this doesn't feel like a good match. You know, they aren't, you know, they they don't want to learn the new skill that I have to teach, or, you know, the time or the effort of this person they can't commit, then we can maybe rework that and rework um, finding them another partner and, you know, no repercussions for speaking up in that process. It's just, we want to get people with the right people. And then again, rewards for the mentors who are the ones who are, um, you know, the mentees will be getting the most out of this relationship and should be, but the, the opportunities for the mentors are building relationships with these senior level leaders. Again, promotion and retention, like we saw from that um, second slide. Relationships, opportunities for them to learn something new. They need to be open to that as a part of this process. All right, so let's talk about setup and training for reverse mentoring programs. 
you got to have clear goals. So again, in that in that initial survey, when people apply for the program as a mentor or a mentee, why are you doing this? What do you hope to get out of it? Are you wanting to share a skill? Maybe it's DEI focused. Maybe it's company culture focused. Maybe your reverse mentoring program has itself a specific focus every time you run it, right? Maybe one time it is about generational information. Maybe the next time it is DEI or company culture or skill-based. You can, you can decide that. Um, both roles need to receive training, just like we talked about. Uh, they need to receive and process potential negative feedback, and they need to know how to do that. And the mentors need to know how to give potentially negative feedback in a way that it can be received well. You need to have an information session for all the participants to give them a lay of the land. And you need to possibly provide some pre-work, okay? So during that giving them the lay of the land informational session, you may provide historical context, right? Why did we as a company decide to do this? What's the overall goal of implementing this program? How is this program going to be successful? Like, what do we hope as a result of people who participate in this program? And then the pre-work on both sides could be resources or templates or conversation starters or articles or eBooks that you can provide them ahead of time. You really do need to create a participant guide as a part of the training, right? The participant guide kind of sets the expectations for everyone. And you can do this in that informational meeting um, or a kickoff meeting, but you want to make sure that everybody understands what they're getting into, right? If you're going to set up a mentoring program, everybody needs to understand the amount of time they're being asked to commit to it and what the goal of the program is. So setting up a time frame, and I'll just give an example. This is usually how we do it internally, but you can do it however you would like is we usually do six one-hour meetings over a three to six month time frame. okay? So during that first initial meeting or during a, an informational meeting or kickoff, once people have been paired up, the mentor and the mentee can decide if they wanna have one-hour meetings once a month over six months, or if they wanna have one-hour meetings every other week over three months, it really just depends on their schedules and what's gonna work best for them but you need to hold them to a time frame to have those things completed by, right? Because if you don't, then if people start canceling or don't want to do, you know, it'll just drag on and on and on. So you need to set up the time frame and you need to set up the guidelines for participation. Again, set that clear objective or goal. So what is the overarching goal for this particular reverse mentoring program or making, and, and why did we start this? What do you hope everybody gets out of it? Um, how are they going to participate in it? And is it going to be a hodgepodge of things? Or is the reverse mentoring program going to have a theme where each pairing is going to discuss basically the same thing? Okay. Provide conversation starters. I'm going to do that at the end of this. I'm also going to give you a guide that has conversation starters in it from Mentor Loop. Um, and it has some really great suggestions in there that will help you get started on this if you are ready to implement. Um, and ask, partic ask participants to log meetings and share feedback. So this is the only way that the person who is going to be kind of overseeing or managing this reverse mentoring program can know how it's going in the moment, right? So you need be people to be able to log the times that they've met. They need to create uh, participate in that pre-survey. So you pair them up with the right person. Um, they can have post-meeting surveys if you're interested in them, surveying them that often, or you can just have a post-program survey where they complete that at the end of all six sessions. And then they need to be able to provide you feedback with the quality of the mentoring program itself. So you really need to make sure that you are getting the information in case people aren't showing up. In case the relationship is not going well, you need, as the manager of the program, need to do that so you can make the appropriate changes um, right then when things are going on. Rochelle, I have a question. I'll yes. go right ahead. Oh, yeah. No, I see it. I see it too. So, um, Rochelle asked, um, what have been some of your group's goals for the process? So, I think for us and the few times that we have done this mentoring process, um, the reverse mentoring process, uh, one, we set up 
with an organization whose goal was for the participants to meet with um, mentees within the community, mentors within. So it was people from the business were going to be the mentors, people in the community were the mentees, and they were going to learn about the community, things in the community, how the business affects the community, um, I mean, things that the business may need to change as um, in order to grow and maintain a positive relationship with the community. So that was a really um, very different but good way of doing it. Now, I think the most common one is generational differences people wanting to learn more about the younger generation, how they work. Um, and I'll touch on some of these at the end as well. Uh, and another really common uh, goal for the process is learning a new skill. So creating an environment where a senior level employee feels really comfortable learning. And I just keep using chat GPT because that's the easiest example, but learning how to use chat BT GPT with a junior level employee who may know how to use it really well and having that one-on-one -on -one time to do that and, and not feeling silly or out of place or not feeling less than because they don't know how to use it and needed some assistance. So those are some of the ones that we've set up. There are four stages to a formal mentoring program or relationship. And these four stages kind of coincide with those six meetings that we told you is how the program usually goes, right? Six meetings over a three to six month period. The first meeting is, is the time to build the relationship. They can do this during the first meeting or you could do it during a program kickoff event. If you're rolling this program out in an organization or a business, you could have a big kickoff event where you pair the mentors up, they meet for the first time, maybe they do an icebreaker activity and they go through some of those first step questions, the confidentiality stuff all together as a part of a kickoff event. Um, and then their first meeting, they can just spend time getting to know each other individually, or you can give them time to do that during kickoff as well. Exchange information and setting goals is usually meeting too, right? So this is where they're exchanging their skills, their abilities, their knowledge, what they can um, share, and they're setting the goal. So what is the mentee's individual and personal goal, right? So the overall program may have a goal, but each individual mentee is gonna have a goal they need to set for why they wanted to participate in the program. Stage three is working towards goals and deepening this engagement, right? So meetings three, four, and five are really where you're gonna deepen your engagement with the individual be careful here because this is where energy can wane, right? This is where people maybe stop responding as much as they did, or um, maybe they miss a meeting or two. So this is why whoever is overseeing the program needs to make sure they kind of know how things are going because meetings three, four, and five are where it could fall apart if you don't really stay on top of it. You want to make sure that you're also not overburdening your mentor with requests and emails and things you want them to do for you or overburdening the mentee as well. So making sure that relationship is, is being reciprocated in the way that it should be. And then stage four is that ending of the formal mentoring relationship, but talking about how they're gonna continue the relationship and planning for the future. Some mentor relationships end and that's it. And that's great, that's fine. They don't. They may not continue a relationship on after that, some people get really close during the mentoring process and they decide to meet for lunch, you know, once a quarter, talk about things or other things can result out of it. It's really up to the mentor and the mentee in that process. So put some potential conversation starters here for you. Um, and then as we wrap up, I'm going to drop in the chat a document that has a whole bunch of information for you that was created by Mentor Loop that I really think you'll find helpful, okay? So potential conversation starters or program starters. So if you want your program to have an overall theme, you can theme the reverse mentoring program. Like I said before, generational differences, it's always a big one, right? Um, but if you don't wanna theme the program, you just wanna have a reverse mentoring program and let each of the pairs decide what it is they want to happen within that relationship. Maybe some are about skill building. Maybe some are about generation or cultural issues. You can certainly do that. But 
the, these are some of the, the discussions that people have. So generational perspectives, like discussing generational differences, understanding how different generations approach work or leadership or problem solving. Um, this really helps to foster greater collaboration and, and a lot of empathy, right? To help us understand what each of the different generations are experiencing and going through. Another great conversation starter here is the future of work. Maybe this mentee has been in the business for 30 plus years and they want their mentor to talk to them about how they see the future of work changing now that they're here in this business and, and what do they need to prepare for and what do they need to prepare the business for so they can attract the best talent. But exploring ideas about the future of work, including values and expectations, um, automation, artificial intelligence, gig economy, all of those things can be super enlightening to a mentee who may have just heard about it in passing, but hasn't really had a chance to talk to somebody about what that's going to look like. Communication styles and preferences. So maybe they talk about how the different, different generations prefer communicating, um, help develop a better understanding of how different generations perceive and approach communication. And then one of my favorites is well-being. And this is really something mentees probably need to hear more than they realize from their mentors. Because I'm telling you right now, Gen Z and the younger generation um, have well-being figured out a lot better than the rest of us do. <laughs> Um, and so they have a lot to offer here that we really need to start listening to um, as the older generation. So discussing strategies for achieving sustainable balance between work responsibilities and personal life. So in reverse mentoring, this is the Gen Z population, your junior leaders, your younger leaders, your newer leaders, talking to older leaders about how they can have a more sustainable work-life balance, how they can balance their work responsibilities and personal life better. Considering the importance of mental and physical health, sharing insights on time management, setting boundaries, which let me just go ahead and say, Gen Z is great at setting boundaries and we get really mad at them about that in the workplace. Uh, but usually we get really mad at them about it um, because we're jealous that we didn't set those boundaries for ourselves when we started working. You hear them set a boundary and all of a sudden you're like, wait, wait a minute, we can do that? I, I can choose not to do something? Wait, <laughs> nobody told me this. So those are always really interesting conversations. The, the mentors can share with their mentees how to prioritize self-care, prevent burnout, how different generations approach work-life integration. And maybe you set up your... Um, either the whole per, the whole reverse mentoring, maybe one time through, you wanna do it on topics of belonging, um, or maybe this is just a topic if they decide as a pair, they wanna explore that. You can talk about employee resource groups, which are typically employee-led groups that focus on creating a sense of community and support for employees who share a common identity or interest. So you can talk about how employee resource groups can sometimes be founded or formed around race, gender, sexual orientation, or just shared interest, um, sustainability, well-being. There are all kinds of employee resource groups that might be really helpful to your organization that the mentee hasn't even thought about setting up or, or providing opportunities for these groups to get together and talk and how these groups can help influence and grow the organization. They can have conversations about global perspectives, especially if you're a global organization. So if you have international experience, you you know these international individuals who are younger and junior employees can often mentor the older employees and give them insight into global markets, into cultures, into business practices, helping them understand the country that they're working with and dealing with a little bit better. And then also just inclusive leadership, exploring how um, this works and how you can work hand in hand with lots of different leadership styles, your values, um, leveraging different perspectives, contributing as individuals. All of these things are different conversation starters or different themes that you could build your reverse mentoring programs around if you were going to have since we're doing it over a, a three to six month period and you wanted to theme 
the whole reverse mentoring program, these were themes you could build them around as well. So what I'm going to do now, and I'm going to open up the floor for questions, but I'm also going to drop in this document that I think will be super helpful for you all from Mentor Loop. Um, kind of get you started and thinking about how you can implement reverse mentoring in your organizations. So the floor is open if you have any questions. And while we wait for some questions to come into the chat or feel free to unmute yourself um, if possible, I'm not sure if I have that permission on, uh, but Shayna, this uh, came to mind. You don't, Terry? Okay, so Terry, go ahead and send me a direct chat uh, message so that I can get that question answered or just drop it in the chat. But my question, Shayna, is when we're thinking about the junior level or new employee, how long should the mentor have been a part of the organization for them to offer or to have valuable insight or experiences to share with the senior level? Great question. So uh, I think it's important and it's really up to each individual organization, but I would say at a bare minimum, they need to have been there for a year. But the one to three year time frame, usually right around three years, um, one to three years is really helpful. Um, that's a good time frame for them to have been there long enough to understand the business, understand their job, see some changes, see how some things have, you know, changed. Maybe a change went smoothly and maybe a change was really, really bumpy. Um, and they can talk about that with the person, um, the senior leader that's going to be their mentee. But I, I feel like they need to have been there long enough to be able to speak to some of that. Um, I will tell you, the average length of stay for Gen Z employees is three years. So most of them, if they aren't changing roles within the organization, they are changing and going to another organization. The average is about three years. So you probably want to catch them in that one to three year range to get some feedback and some information from them. Um, and um, you want to catch them before they walk out the door, especially if they're a great employee. This, again, if you're trying to keep them. This is a great way to do it. Great insight. I like the uh, tidbit about allowing them to have seen some change or experience change within the organization. Um, so regarding confidential information that is shared in these meetings, meetings, should you have some type of confidential, confidential agreement before starting to address these concerns? Oh, absolutely. You got to have the confidentiality agreement um, that everybody signs. Either they can do it, you know, electronically. Or if you have a kickoff meeting, like we were talking about, like a kickoff of the program where you're going to have all the mentors and mentees there and you're going to do um, ice breaking activities with them and they're going to get to know and meet their their mentor mentee pair for the first time. Have them sign it all in any paperwork that needs to be signed. That's, all, you know, confidentiality. Go over it with the whole group. Point out those things that need to be pointed out and have them sign it all before that first meeting, that for first one-on-one -on -one meeting they're going to have. Because um, that is the critical step in this. The the honoring people's time, they, they need to really understand how important that is. But two, that, you know, this is a relationship and things that are discussed in the privacy of this relationship should not be shared outside of, you know, especially if the mentee is sharing an issue they're struggling with with the mentor that they want their advice and input and feedback on. The mentor then doesn't need to go out and tell everybody in their department that senior leadership just shared that X has happened. You know, they need to make sure that they feel like they are in a safe place uh, where they can have some of these conversations that could be helpful to everybody. Thank you for that insight, Shana. And I just had a question that popped up and, and maybe you can't speak to this, Shana, but if there is something that is like HR sensitive or, or something that needs immediate, um, you know, uh, resolution or, or being addressed, how can the 
mentor, mentee go about, you know, ringing the alarm on an issue that's sensitive? Yeah, so um, that's probably also something that needs to be part of the confidentiality process um, and discussed in that same vein. So a lot of us in the organizations and the businesses we work in are mandated reporters, right? So if someone shares information with you that is of an HR related or legal related nature, that something has happened to them on the job um, from another employee, things like that, which in a mentoring relationship, that kind of stuff really shouldn't be being shared, but there's always the possibility that it could be. Um, this is why it's important to create that conversation guide and to keep people on track. But in the in the you know very remote instance that it is, then you need to tell the person, you know, encourage them to reach out to HR, encourage them to share that information. Um, you can reach out to HR yourself and let them know that you know something was disclosed and you feel it's necessary for that person to talk to HR or legal about it, but do not give advice, do not counsel, do not share that information outside of the space of that meeting. Um, but, you know, other than with HR or legal, should that be necessary? But absolutely no, when it comes to giving advice or trying to tell them what to do yourself, don't enter that space, that is not your space. Um, that is for to be handled by others within the organization. Um, and uh, that's to protect yourself um, in that in that situation. Uh, same with when we do coaching. We always say coaching is not counseling. And when people disclose information in a coaching relationship that is um, related, I may recommend they see a counselor. I may rep recommend they see someone to talk about those things. But coaching is really to stay work focus. I don't give advice or talk about personal relationships or tell them how they should handle their spouse or their significant other or their kids or anything else because that's not where we're at. We are here to stay focused on the work. For sure. And I think that the conversation guides would definitely be a good um, work around that. Uh, we yeah. do have a question about Gen Zers. Uh, what do you do when you have a Gen Zer that does not work and they stay on their phones all day? When you report it to your supervisor, nothing is being done. Um, so I would say report it to your supervisor if you if they are not getting their work done, right? But if you saying you have reported it to your supervisor and nothing is being done. I don't know how much more you can do in that particular instance other than to try to grow your relationship with that particular employee. A lot of times it's really important for us to be curious and not furious, right? So I know, I know it's infuriating to see them on their phones all the time. I am just as addicted to mine as everybody else is to theirs, right? By this time, we have all become Pavlov's dog. That thing dings and we look at it, right? That thing makes a noise or screen fires up and you're like, oh, what is that? Let me look at that. So I, I, th I my advice is to get curious. You know, what are they doing on there? Um, who Do they have enough to do? If they're not getting work done, you know, then maybe having a conversation with them directly about, you know, hey, what do you need in order to get your work accomplished? What, you know, having those direct conversations, being curious with them, kind of asking questions can be a lot more helpful than just getting frustrated and furious with them about their behavior um, without really talking to them about what needs to be done. A lot of Gen Z employees, when they quote unquote finish their work, they're finished. And unless you give them something else specific to do and work on, they're going to jump on their phones and they may stay at work the next couple of hours that they're there, but they may not be working because their understanding is, well, the three tasks you gave me are done. Well, yes, but maybe you need to, maybe they need to have longer term projects. Maybe they need some more goals. Maybe they need some more things to do. Uh, Quite honestly, a lot of times they're a lot faster with some of this stuff than we were. I'm not speaking to you directly. I'm sure you're very fast. But some of us took hours, you know, but others, it only takes them 
them minutes, you know, and then sometimes you just have lazy employees and that's not a generational thing. <laughs> you know, there are lazy employees in every generation. So trying to figure out what's going on there. Thanks, Shana. And someone also gave some advice in the chat. Keep in mind HR rules, um, yep. Yvette, that may prevent you from knowing some of the disciplinary actions that are taking place um, in the background. But we Very are good. at 12 o'clock and I want to honor your time. So we thank you for joining us today. And I will be following up with you within, within the next 48 business hours to send you a link uh, to this recording for you to share with um, some people that you may have identified already as your champions for a uh, reverse mentoring program, um, as well as the presentation and any other resources that were shared today. Uh, we are taking a break for the summer, but, but our series will resume in August with Radical Candor. So please uh, head to our website, follow us on LinkedIn and Facebook um, to stay connected with us and, and to see that um, the, the information for our next webinar. On behalf of the Leadership Institute, I thank you for your questions, all of your interest and engagement. Uh, if you have any topics as we begin planning for the 2025 series, I know that is hard to say, but it, once we start planning for next year, which will be here before we know it, please send us um, any recommendations on topics that uh, you would like to know more about or that we could offer any of our expertise on. Um, please email us at leadershipinstitute at columbusstate.edu. Thank you again for your time today. Hope you all enjoy what is left of your week. Bye. Thanks, guys.